Our agenda this morning, we'll talk about pre-bid conferences, we'll talk about marketing your firms, we'll talk about networking, we'll talk about teaming and subcontractor agreements, and the prime subcontractor panel. So how do you get the most out of your pre-bid conferences and site walks? Now, just to note, this also includes pre-proposal and pre-statement of qualification conferences. I noticed that a, a number of you are engineering, some of you are selling um, stuff, others of you are, looks like you're on the construction side of the house, some architects. So I want to make sure that we cover all of the pre award kind of conferences that you might be going to. When I use the term pre-bid conference, this means pre-bid, pre-proposal, pre-statement of qualifications, and that should probably cover just about everybody, I think. So what does this pre-bid conference do? The official reason for it is to give everybody a better chance to understand the project, meet the players from the agency that's got the work, um, re receive clarifications, ask questions, and in general find out as much as they can about the conference. Um, the whole point of it is to do just that, but also gives you a chance to figure out Who's your competition? What team should you be on? Are you on the right team? Can you network with people? Can you find a teaming partner? This is a good place for small businesses and DBEs to market their companies and demonstrate their skills and experience. I want to give you a, a little hint though. If you haven't started talking to uh, people to team up with before the pre-bid conference or the pre-proposal conference. Um, you're a little bit late on some of the bigger pro procurements. A lot of times teaming starts uh, just when these projects are an idea as opposed to something real. Now that's for the consultant side of the house. It's different for the contractor side of the house where you really can't do anything until there's a chance for you to actually put in a hard bid. So gives you a better chance to understand the project, as I said, gives you a chance to see what is what with the project team, gives you an opportunity to look at your competition, a good chance to network, and a good chance for you as a small business and a DBE to demonstrate your interest and your skills. This is usually open to all interested and prospective bidders. However, sometimes where pre-qualification or shortlisting is carried out, only pre-qualified or shortlisted bidders are invited to attend the pre-bid meeting. But in general, we're all invited to attend. And you can really take this opportunity to ask the project manager or the contract manager questions. This is also, it's also important that this is a marketing opportunity for you. Bring business cards, bring your marketing materials, bring your extroverted skills. Mandatory pre-bid conferences are great because anybody that wants to bid or propose as a prime must be in the room. You can get a copy of the sign-in sheet and you can contact those companies directly and let them know who you are and what you do. Normally, a pre-bid conference or a pre-proposal conference comes four to six weeks before the end or when the proposal or the bid is due. The, the slide says uh, halfway through the bidding period. But it's usually four to six weeks before uh, the bid or the proposal is due. For the most part, the client has the project manager, somebody from uh, architects, architecture or engineering department, maybe somebody from contracts, um, a contract administrator, uh, usually, if there's a DBE percentage, the DBE liaison person will, there, will be there. If you're serious about wanting to be on teams, about wanting to network, 
you really need to have yourself or a senior person from your company at the meeting. For some of the larger firms, they're, they're not sending their senior administrators or their senior decision makers, or as I say, their chief cheese bags in charge. They're, sometimes they send their proposal managers. Proposal managers are also a good person to know. You will fill out a sign-in sheet. They will be gathering data for you, uh, about you. Uh, this is a good place to say that you're certified, whether you're new to the department. This is a good place to ask the agency any kind of question you want. I will tell you, though, what was told to me by a very good mentor of mine that you should really not ask any question verbally at these conferences. It's better to put your question in writing. Why, you may ask, why shouldn't I ask a question if I have one? Because you don't want everybody else to hear it or to hear what you don't understand or to get the information out of your mouth or make any kind of opinions about you. Again, this is my own personal opinion. This is the way I was taught, and I'm just giving that to you. You may ask a question, of course, if you want. Most of the time, they give you an opportunity to ask questions in writing, and that's the best place to do it. So you walk into a pre-bid pre conference or a pre-proposal conference, and depending on the size of the project, there will be a few people in the room or it will be packed. So uh, make sure you get there in a timely manner so that you can have a place to sit or have a place to stand in the back where you can scope out everybody. There will always be an agenda. They'll do an introduction. They'll talk about the project. They'll reveal any technical issues that may be on the project. They'll talk about the DBE program, and they'll talk about what their percentages are. 27%, 28% DBE requirement. That means they have to fill that. And I know if you're working with a lot of the agencies in Southern California, including Caltrans and also Metro, um, they will tell you that uh, they intend to fill the percentages. There's no good faith effort. Gosh, we couldn't find anybody. So we all have an opportunity out there. There will also be somebody talking about labor compliance if it's a public works project. They'll talk administ about administrative stuff, pricing, what the payment procedure is, any special items, and they will always give you a chance to network. You can get a copy of the list of people that were there, the people that have gotten the proposal or the plans, and you can also use those to contact people that you think uh, could benefit for, from your expertise. So, what should you do before you go? Well, number one, read the RFP. Make sure you know if there's an opportunity for you there. If you don't see an opportunity for you in the RFP, that's a good question to ask the agency. Um, it's always okay to go to a pre-proposal or pre-bid conference, even if there's nothing for you in the RFP, because it's a good place to network, and you might pick up information. I know just recently I attended a pre-proposal conference for, uh, at Metro for safety, um, but in reading the RFP before we went, I noticed that it was for system safety, and that is not what we do. We do construction safety. But we thought it might be good just to go down there and listen to what was going on. Maybe there's a new business opportunity. As it turned out, we made a connection with a very senior member of the safety department at Metro that we hadn't met before. So it was really good that we attended, even though we're not going to pursue the RFP or get on any teams, because it simply isn't in our area of expertise. So make sure you're prepared. Read the RFP. Decide if you want to go. Um, make sure you know the time and the place. Uh, have questions prepared ahead of time if you can. You can ask them at the pre-bid conference. Normally, there will be an opportunity to ask questions or to write down questions. And there will be usually a period of time after the pre-bid conference. Sometimes at pre-bid conferences, they'll also have a site walk. And so you should be 
very, very up on the specs and the plans. If you don't have the plans and specs, by all means, do try and get them. So, how else can you get information about this bid or this proposal? Research. Is there an incumbent? Who's worked with the agency or owner in the past? And what is their reputation? Understand the work that you want to perform on this project and determine if you are qualified to perform the work. Come prepared to talk about your company. Bring your business cards. Bring your capability statement or your one-page leave behind. Make sure you have your elevator speech. That is a succinct speech about your company and the value you bring to the Primes firm, or to the Primes team, sorry. Remember, your job is always to make sure that the Prime knows how you're going to make their life easier. Follow up. Always the tough part for me is the follow up. So you review the attendees list, hopefully you can read what the email addresses and phone numbers are, and you follow up with everybody you spoke with and with the Prime. Be responsive. If a Prime contacts you about possible subcontracting, make sure you jump on that. That is a great position to be in. And always, always be thankful and be grateful Thank Primes for the opportunity, tell them how grateful you are for their help, and you look forward to future opportunities, even if they can't use you on this one. So we're going to talk a little bit about how you find a Prime. Most of the time, for those of us in small business, we may have opportunities for small business, disadvantaged business, but most of the time we're going to be looking to attach ourselves to a Prime contractor to get a piece of the work that's described. So how do you find these people? I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the difference between sales and marketing first. Sales is selling the client something you make. And we have some people uh, in this class, I believe, that are selling products. That's sales. Marketing is you provide what the client needs. So sales. The customer exists for the business, and in marketing, the business exists for the customer. That's a little convoluted, but basically the difference is we're going to market ourselves as service companies. We have what the client needs. We have that service. I'm going to sell to the client if I'm making a widget of some sort that the client needs. If I'm making a if I'm making a hard hat, if I'm making boots, if I'm making uh, lawnmower equipment, I'm going to be selling that. If I'm providing construction management services, I have a service that the client needs. So I need to market my firm. So what does the customer need? What does Caltrans need? Well, Caltrans needs all kinds of things. They're a huge bureaucratic organization in California, one of the biggest in the world. What do they need? Everything from engineering, architecture, construction management, construction to any kind of material you can imagine. So for all of us here, we've got to determine what does Caltrans need or what does the agency need or what does the client need that I provide. And number two, what is my competitive advantage? Am I cheaper? Am I faster? Am I, in my case, am I better looking? No, I'm just kidding there. But you have to figure out why should this customer use you as opposed to anybody else? One of the most important things about marketing is focus, especially if you're just starting out. Select specific markets to serve. And I'll give you an example of SafeWork. When we started 25 years ago, I thought I could do everything for everybody. And we started out working at the city of Los Angeles down at the Hyperion uh, treatment plant down by the airport. 
and we were a woman-owned business enterprise, disadvantaged business enterprise. We were very, very popular, and there was all kinds of opportunity. And I learned the hard way that we couldn't go after everything. We simply couldn't grow that fast. We had to figure out what was our core competency. And at that time, it was pure safety. Now, over the next five years, we grew to providing um, more broad construction management services. So that growth can come. And then we had to decide what specific market were we going to serve. Gee, it sounded fun to have an international project, but we were just starting out. We needed to stick to the neighborhood, which was basically Los Angeles County and Orange County. What you have to do after that, and what we did, is figure out how to satisfy the needs of the customer. When we started out, it was a new idea that safety was now not just the responsibility of the construction contractor on the job, but it also fell under the agency owner to have some responsibility for safety. All of a sudden, the client had a need, and we had the expertise. So make sure you look at it. What does the client need? What is your advantage? Where do you want to do this? And how can you satisfy the needs of this client? And that is your elevator speech. When you go out and talk to people, about your firm. Talk about what you bring, but make sure you know what your weaknesses are. You're not necessarily going to blurt those out, but understand what you can bring to the party. But also understand yourself what areas of development your company still needs. Please understand what you can't do in addition to what you can do, and showcase what you can. Understand, understand the scope of the job and the requirements. Make sure you know what you can perform. And make sure you team up with a prime that has the experience in doing what the requirements of the RFP are or the requirements of the project are. One of the biggest things in the industry today is the word quality. Make sure you are able to show how your firm has done quality work and what past performances uh, what what is essentially what is your experience? What does your past performance say about you? Make sure you meet deadlines. Make sure res you're responsive and step up with assistance with the bid. Now I'm going to tell you a little story about something that happened a couple of months ago. We were, after 25 years, we were asked to joint venture with another very large engineering firm on a project. Uh, there were three of us DBE firms that were asked to join this large firm in going after some work here in Los Angeles. So we, we agreed to that. And as one of the things that we had to do is we had to have a meet the DBE community um, meeting so that we would talk to various DBEs in the greater Los Angeles community to form the team that would go after this project. Those meetings were very, very interesting, and the people and the firms that we chose were people that came prepared. They had a, a, a leave behind that talked about their experience, that talked about the work that they'd done that maybe gave references. They talked about uh, the people they had that could come on a project. They had obviously read the RFP and knew what the requirements of the RFP were. The companies that didn't get added to the team were people that came and said, well, I don't know how we can help you, but we really want to be on your team. I actually had one person say that to me. If you don't know how you're going to help the team, and you don't know what you can do, then maybe this proposal or maybe this bid isn't the right one for you to pursue. If you have no experience whatsoever as a company, but you have individual experience, please showcase that. Primes in general want to know what you've done and how you can help them. And when you're added to the team, then you get to help them. To. You provide assistance with the bid. So you say, how do I find these guys? 
Well, government agencies certainly have lists of everybody that they've worked with. Caltrans, I know, provides prime contractor information. Every small business person in any of these agencies will give you a list of people that they do business with, with firms, with prime firms that they do business with. Most importantly, talk to the primes. Go to events. I know Metro has a Meet the Primes event. I know Caltrans District 7 here in Los Angeles always has uh, events where you can go and talk to them. There are various um, associations, AGC, uh, AIA, um, ACEC, CMAA, WTS, Women in Construction, all these different folks have events uh, where they will have people from these agencies coming and speaking to them about projects and about how to do business with them. All of that information is, is available on the great internet. All you have to do is a little research. Get on notification lists, keep your databases current, know who the other DBEs are, talk to each other, talk to the primes. You can do this. It just is work. So, what is networking? Networking is developing a relationship. The relationship is developed to meet the needs of two parties or more on an ongoing basis. It's not about, hi, I'm Rebecca, what, can you, what kind of work can you give me now? It's, hi, I'm Rebecca from SafeWork. I do construction management services and provide safety and inspection. What is it that you do? Tell me a little bit about you. When did you start? Blah, blah, blah. In fact, networking is an awful lot like dating and building relationships and making friends. I don't know about you, but what I found in my business after 25 years, it's all about the relationship and less about who works for who. I'm doing business with a bunch of people now that have moved around to all kinds of different organizations and have moved from the private sector into the public sector and from the public sector into the private sector. You're not going to form a relationship with everybody, but you are going to form relationships with people that you like, people that you know. It is a long-term relationship built on trust credibility and a general concern for the other person. Sounds an awful lot like a marriage, doesn't it? And the interesting comment at the last bullet point, it's not about who you know, but who wants to know you. We're all in this business to get projects built, to get materials sold, to be successful, to make a reasonable profit, and we do that through our relationships with people. So remember, when you're calling primes, you're talking to subs, start with information that brings value to them before asking to be placed on the team. There's a, an interesting book called Servant Leadership, and I have taken that a step further to say this company, the company that I run, is in service to others. It doesn't really matter what that service is. It happens to be construction management, but we serve our clients, we serve our crimes, we serve our employees, and we serve the community. And I think that that really is one of the foundations of success, to know how you can be of service. It's very hard for people to tell you no if you're providing service to them, whether it's a good service in trucking, a good service in demolition, a good service in architecture, a good service in engineering, it doesn't matter as long as you're providing a good service and you're service oriented. And I know you all are because you're all in small business. So if you break down networking, what steps do you need to take? So what business categories do you want to build a relationship in? Do you want to know other engineering and construction management firms? Do you need to know architectural firms? Do you need to know big prime contractors? Do you need to know other trucking companies? Do you need to know 
other oil delivery companies. I see some folks here are in lighting. Um, who, what are the business categories you want to build a relationship with? Look at yourself, determines what skills, abilities, talents, and contacts you have. Create a chart. What's so interesting about you? Non-business related categories. Do you golf? Do you go camping? Do you, you know, are you a Civil War enthusiast? Uh, do you participate in uh, any sort of extracurricular activities? Are you going to school? Anything that you can make a connection with another person. So, know what to say. How can you help the other person you're talking to? What do they need? What are they about? Then let the person know what you do and how you benefit your clients. Talk a little bit about the client challenges, the client benefits, what you offer, and make the personal connection. When does networking start? Networking starts anywhere. It can start on an airplane. It can start at a conference, any professional association, at a pre-bid conference, at a bidding opportunity, and with primes and other vendors. Let me talk for a minute about the psychology of this. You can see here, as a small business owner, you are networking and it never stops. You stay in touch with people and subcontractors. You attend conferences and meetings. You provide leads to others. This is probably one of the most important things you do to build your business, and it is a very extroverted activity. So if you're shy and you don't really like to talk to other people, that's fine. But find somebody in your company that can take the lead in networking and business development. And if there is no one but you, my advice as one shy person to another, you need to do it if you want your company to be a success. Be prepared. Be attentive. Talk about, again, how your firm can help. Be proud of your company and what you've built so far. Even if you've only been in business for a few months, you know what? You took the step that a lot of people out there will never take. And be proud of that. Know what niches you can fill. Know whether or not your prime needs that niche. Talk about the uniqueness of you. One of the most powerful words in the English language is know. Be ready to listen and be ready to say in your own mind, no go for a particular opportunity. Know whether or not you have the competency or resources to help the prime. Whatever you do, please folks, don't offer what you can't deliver. That is the worst thing in the world. You've got to be able to deliver. Because we exist in small business land based on our reputation. And there is nothing more important than that reputation. Understand what your prime expects from you, even though they may not communicate it. Ask questions. Ask about when do you want things to be delivered, what time, uh, uh, what kind of format do you want things delivered in. Understand what they expect. I was having a conversation with a friend of mine this morning. We're both going after the same project. We're friendly competitors, and we were swapping notes. And he was telling me about the, the very worst kind of call he got this morning was from another client of his who said, do you have the proposal ready for me? And my friend said, I didn't know you needed it today. And uh, the client said, oh, yeah, I have a meeting at 1. Can you get it to me by noon? And this was the assignment he'd gotten just two days prior, but he hadn't asked what the prime's expectations were, and now he was scrambling. Now, he's very good at scrambling, and he's very good at delivering, so he'll be okay. But just remember that primes and clients may not verbalize exactly what they expect, and it is our responsibility to ask them. What do you expect, and when do you want it? Teaming subcontractor and non-disclosure agreements. So what is a teaming agreement? A teaming agreement talks about 
the opportunity to define a prime subcontractor relationship. So let's 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 use an example. Your company has been asked to join a team to provide services for a project. And your prime sends you a teaming agreement. In that teaming agreement, the prime will say, here is how our relationship is going to go. And here are the terms of the contract that you have to be willing to sign should we win. It's not just going steady. Remember, a teaming agreement will probably have a non-disclosure line in it, but it is not a non-disclosure agreement. A teaming agreement may have different items in it, and my strong suggestion to you, unless you have a legal background, is to read it carefully and make sure you understand exactly what you're getting into. And if you do have an attorney or uh, your cousin is an attorney, um, have a legal person read it over just to make sure in general you're not hanging yourself in any way. Most teaming agreements are pretty boilerplate, but it's, the, it's a very interesting way to understand what the prime wants in the subcontractor relationship. What you'll look for in a teaming agreement, exclusivity. Do they want you to be exclusively on their team and no other team? When you sign that, that's what you're saying. And it's not kosher to then be on any other team. Um, a lot of times primes want to keep their options open, but they want to bind us to the team. And you can always say no. Sometimes, well, a lot of times prime want, primes want you to be exclusive in order to take you off of the competitive arena. So for us, a lot of times, primes want us to be exclusive because we have a certain safety expertise and certain relationships with safety departments in various agencies around town. So a lot of times, primes want us to be exclusive with them, not because they think they'll win, but because they want to keep us away from their competitors. It's always a difficult decision that I have to make whether we're going to go exclusive or not. And if we are going to go exclusive, then I want some guarantee of how much work I may get from them. Sometimes primes want to do that. Sometimes primes don't. So look very carefully at your teaming agreement items. You want to make sure you understand what the subcontract is for that you may be signing. You want to understand what you're going to bind yourself to with this prime. You want to understand exclusivity and whether or not you want to do that, if that's good for your firm. Politically, you might have to go exclusive if you want to develop a relationship with somebody. At the beginning of the year, I got a call from an old friend of mine who works at a company, a very large engineering and construction management firm downtown Los Angeles, and he said, Rebecca, I thought we were going to have an exclusive arrangement on this teaming agreement and I got the agreement back and you're not exclusive. Well, I had missed that in the teaming agreement when I had sent it to our marketing people and I had missed telling our marketing gal that uh, this was an exclusive agreement and it was a little bit embarrassing for me. Luckily, I've known this guy for over 20 years. So I said to him, of course we're exclusive to you. We're not on any other team. And he said, okay. So it's a real political game, too, and it's a relationship game. Reminds me very much of promising to go to a high school dance with one guy and not every guy. In the teaming agreement, look for the work contract, what the work content is. Sometimes primes want to be flexible. And they talk in terms of goals and targets. And we as subcontractors want a whole lot more specific than that. What is my specific work scope or what percentage of work am I going to get? So you can do a little cost proposal negotiation earlier. Primes will want to have subcontractors make concessions sometimes at best and final offer, BAFO. Sometimes subcontractors have no part in input in those negotiations. So be careful what you're getting into understand what the rules of the game are. And they change. And remember, a key teaming agreement is not the contract. It is merely an agreement to be bound 
at the proposal or bid preparation stage, and it's an agreement to be bound by the terms and conditions of the contract. Subs usually need to provide project descriptions, resumes, references, rates, prices, and sometimes must do a write-up of technical portion of the work. So you want to make sure you know what you're getting into and how hard you'll have to work for the proposal or for the bid. It's a lot of work, all the preparation we have to do in advance. And there's no guarantee that we're going to win. Make sure you understand what your scope of work actually is. Key teaming agreement items will also include your responsibility for questions and clarifications, your submission of proposal materials, what's expected from you, that exclusive word again, whether you're exclusive or non-exclusive, how you may be involved in negotiations once the contract has been awarded, and your agreement to not disclose any terms and conditions or anything, in fact, about the proposal or the bid that you're preparing with that prime. The term and termination of the teaming agreement will also be in that teaming agreement. Usually it ends at the period of time where a proposal or is accepted or a bid has been accepted. And it will also talk about if there's any disagreement, uh, what the warranties and limitations on remedies are, what legal responsibilities you, you must have. So let's say it's all good news and you're on the winning team. Your subcontract that you get from your prime should reflect what is in your teaming agreement. The critical terms have already been addressed. You already know what's going on. Usually at a time more favorable to you than post-award, you've known this from the teaming agreement. And please note that the subcontract, sometimes the type of subcontract, does not have to be the same as the prime contract. The prime may be a firm fixed price and the subcontract may be time and material. So the type of subcontract is negotiable. And the contract and the subcontract trumps any agreement. You, once you've signed the contract, that contract trumps anything you have agreed to in the teaming agreement. Make sure, however, in your sub subcontract, you know the scope of work, the time, the period of time that you're expected to perform, and the level of effort as much as you can. Usually that's in an, um, an appendix that will describe all of this. Normally, at least from my perspective, what I've seen in my land of subconsultant, the contract will be pretty much a boilerplate and it will usually flow down everything that the, that the prime has with the client. So it's important that I know and I, ha and I am given what the prime contract says so I can compare them. And then attached to it, I'll have something called Appendix A that talks about scope of work, initial budget, period of performance, level of effort. Let's talk about our favorite topic now, compensation. Compensation may have been in your cost proposal, but it should be spelled out in your subcontract as well. What are the invoicing and payment terms? Paid when paid, 30, 45, or 60 days. If a prime contractor has to submit an invoice by, let's say, the 10th day of the month, the subcontractor then has to submit an invoice to the prime prior to that. So we, you need to know when you need to be providing your invoice to your prime because the prime has to vet your invoice prior to submittal of the whole Thing. You can put a small business stamp, prompt payment stamp on your invoice, that's okay. I know in my world of consultant land, we are paid when paid, usually between five and ten days after that. Identify who has the authority to bind the prime, who is authorized to bind the subcontractor. The person with the authority to bind the prime is usually the client but you want to find out who in the client agency is signing that contract, who is authorized to bind, and who is authorized to bind the subcontractor. Remember when you're a sub, you don't work for the prime. I mean, I'm sorry, you work for the prime. You don't work for the end client. 
So one of the rules of the road is you have a problem with the prime, you go to the prime. Dispute resolution, hopefully you never have a dispute. You continue to perform. You put the prime on notice of the dispute and you have a choice of arbitration or court usually and that is spelled out in your contract. For those of us that work primarily in the government agency world, remember we work for the prime. We don't work for the agency. So you work through the prime. And the prime also has pressure to resolve any disputes because they don't want to get a black eye in terms of their client. What if something happens and the government shuts down, what do you do? That should be spelled out in your subcontract agreement. I know this is important if you do federal work and the federal government is unable to come up with a budget. A lot of times they'll have uh, slowdowns or shutdowns. What is your responsibility if that happens? Please note in your subcontract whether you have a right to correct your errors and a right to rework and replacement and what are the terms of those. Also know who holds the rights in your work product and your data rights. Most of the time your work product becomes the property of the project, especially if you work in the government sector. Please note in the subcontractor agreement who has responsibility for performance delays. What, is, what are the terms and conditions for performance delays? What is the term of the subcontract? What are options? Can you be terminated for convenience or default and cause? And what are those terms? And again, stop work. What is the reasonable time for that? I would again encourage you, if you don't have an attorney, to have one. They can save you a lot of heartburn if they can review your contracts. And when you look for an attorney, look for someone that has experience in your area of expertise. You're not going to go to a family law attorney or to your cousin Vinny necessarily unless they have experience in the kind of work that you do. So in continuing with our subcontractor agreements, look at the non-compete language if there is something. Interference with employees, there's a lot of times is a non-solicitation clause. A non-compete requirement must be reasonable. Um, the non-solicitation clause says you're not going to poach employees nor are you going to be poached uh, by the prime or any of the people on the pro or any of the businesses on the project. Non-compete requirements should be should be for that project only. Make sure that non-compete requirements are not too broad. They should be for a reasonable time and they cannot interfere with your business as you do your general business. So if you have a sub-agreement with the prime and they say you cannot compete on any water projects, you can only compete on water projects with that prime, that is way too broad it's not a reasonable time and it interferes with you being able to do your business and quite frankly it's probably against the law. Now I have never seen a contract that was that broad but you should always be aware. Remember the contract is your responsibility. Make sure you know. All the flow down clauses make sure they're required. Some clauses are only for applicable or are only applicable for subcontracts of certain dollar thresholds. And for certain scopes of work, let me give you an example. We work on projects that are very near active railways. And active railways need a specific type of insurance. But if I'm putting an administrative person on a project and they're going to be in a project office that is five miles away from the actual project site where the live rail is, do I need to be carrying railroad worker protection insurance if that administrative person will never set foot on that project site? So those are things that you have to understand what your, what your scope is and how the flow down clauses may apply to you. And they are negotiable. If you don't think they're applicable for you, you can always ask the question of your prime. 
this in a nutshell, folks, is uh, basically the presentation and the webinar today. You have all taken an important step, that is starting your own business. There's an awful lot of opportunity out there, an awful lot for all of us. And I encourage you to develop your marketing plan, understand networking, know your subcontractor agreements, know what you're getting into, have a good time, get lots of work, and at the end of the day, you go home happy because you started your own business, and good for you. <laughs>